Hi everyone, I'm Katie Loic with the social media team, and today we're going to be doing a live tour of the Chevron archive. Join me to meet John Harper, our Chevron historian, and the team of archivists that he works with to preserve all of this history that we're going to be seeing today. Hi John, how are you doing? Hi Katie, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks I'm for having me. Grateful to have this opportunity to share with you the Chevron archive. It's a treasure trove of information that traces the company's evolution from the 19th century to the present. That's incredible. So what is this that we have out here today? Well, as you know, we didn't start as a large oil company. We started as a very modest company back in 1879, and we were known as Pacific Coast Oil Company. And there in Pico Canyon, just northwest of Los Angeles, we drilled the companies and the uh, California's mm -hmm. first oil well wow. back in 1876 and 1877. That's incredible. Pico number four there on the far right drilled uh, the first commercial oil well, uh -huh. and it was about 70 barrels per day. Wow, and it looked just like this. Yes, it did look very much like that. Hard to believe. One of our most recent acquisitions in the archive is this book here, and this dates back to the Pico era, 1870s, 1880s. And actually, this book contained the well logs, the well maps, from the various wells that were drilled back then. And this is really a nice treasure. This is probably wow. our oldest um, piece of history from the company's heritage. Wow, so how old are these pieces? Well, we think that this was developed in about 1895. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are about 20 different maps within this little booklet here. Wow, that's incredible. So where do you get all of these materials from? The material comes in in a variety of ways. Sometimes we purchase items mm -hmm. that we find on eBay or from other owners, oh, okay. um, these Petroliana uh, collectors. And occasionally we have um, donations come in mm -hmm. outside, uh, retirees and whatnot, but mm -hmm. most often we actually mine our own records facilities. Okay. This facility is about 12,000 square feet, but we have record centers that are far larger. Mm -hmm. We go into those and we decide what are the significant documents we really want to keep here for permanent preservation okay. to tell our story. Great. And it's a very elaborate process of finding, identifying that material mm -hmm. and bringing it in and then getting it ultimately into the archive proper. And so are we going to take a look at what you do? I'd love to show you how we go about doing that. Great. So of all these materials that your team looks for and you mine for, how do you decide how much to keep and what's worthy, if you will, of putting in the archive? It's a very good question. It's a difficult um, uh, process. An archive typically keeps, well, a business archive keeps far less than 1% of the total record wow. the company produces. Um, now deciding exactly what you keep can take time and analysis. Mm -hmm. And it can also be a very tedious um, process, especially when it comes to objects. Well, Katie, welcome to the intake room. Wow, there's a lot of stuff in here. Yes, this is the first stage in the process of bringing in material into the archive and ultimately into uh, permanent preservation. There indeed is a lot of material. Do you get this much stuff in every day, every week? How Depends. does that work? Depends. We can get 60 boxes in in a day or even more. Or we can go a few weeks without getting material. It okay. also depends on how much time we have to go out there and start searching for material, which there seems to be no end to. I'm sure. So what kind of materials do we get in here? All sorts. We get memorabilia, artifacts, paper documents, photographs, film, as you can see. Right now, we just received a collection of 28 boxes from Standard Oil Company of Kentucky that okay. we brought in from Louisville, Kentucky. And right now, Samantha O'Brien is going through some of that. Hi, Samantha. Hi. What are you working on? All right, now I'm just unpacking the materials that we got in from Kentucky and checking the conditions to make sure everything arrived in one piece. Um, checking to see if there's any mold or sign of pests mm -hmm. and uh, right now it's just acclimating to our environment where we have controlled temperature and humidity. Mm -hmm. That's great. So yeah. do you always have to wear gloves like that to protect the materials? Not always. I do wear them when I handle metals mm -hmm. and, and things that are pretty sturdy but if I, it's extra delicate I'll take them off and just use clean hands. Great. So what's this list that you're working with here? That's uh, an inventory that we got in from the donor, and it's really great when we get a detailed inventory like that. It really helps us to make sure we got everything from the collection and helps our cataloging process afterwards. I bet. Yeah. So after you've cataloged all these materials, what's the next step? Well, after we decided what we're going to keep, what we've deemed as significant um, enduring value, we bring it into the processing room. And let me show you that, OK? Great. You can see there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Yeah. It could be overwhelming. It is, and it's time intensive too. Uh, 
archivist trade um, requires a lot of patience, whether imagine. you're working with old photographs um, or you're working with brittle books. We saw Samantha just working with. That's true. Um, and then we have all those controls that we need to keep in place. Mm -hmm. To keep everything safe and Correct. keep it from getting harmed. So we're leaving the intake room and okay. then we're entering what's called the processing room. Okay. And this is where we start to impose intellectual discipline over the material we have so we know how to yep. use it and where it should go. I was going to say, you can tell there's a definitely a different atmosphere in here than in the intake room. Right. And right now, over at this table here, we have some old artifacts that we brought in from our own company, from okay. the Richmond Refinery. And this is Maura Warnicke. Hi. Hi, Maura. <laughs> she is our second archivist here. And she's busy doing what, Maura? I am trying to dismantle these displays um, that we got out at the refinery. Um, contains all these great artifacts and documents here. Um, and while they were trying to do a good thing by sharing the company history with the employees, um, it wasn't done in the best manner. So you can see they kind of drilled holes through product cans. Oh, wow. Um, and they stapled and glued documents onto these boards. So we're trying to get them off in a safe manner so that we can house them appropriately and um, make them last forever to share with the the employees. That's great. I'm sure you have to balance, you know, sharing all this great history that we have here and also preserving it and making sure, like you said, that it doesn't get damaged through its process. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, employees want to see this stuff, so it's really cool to be able to share it, but we want to do it in a safe manner for the Definitely. materials. As with everything we do. So, so this is a really cool piece right here. Um, we got off one of the boards um, a couple months ago, and it shows our um, original company, the Pacific Coast Oil uh -huh. Company. They're stock certificates oh, wow. from 1879. That's incredible. So you can see these were in a window that had sunshine <laughs> coming in on them. They look a little antiqued. <laughs> but if you look back where the sun was not shining on them, this is how they really should look. Oh my gosh, wow. So you can actually read the names and dates. Yeah, and, um, almost just like a regular check or stock certificate you'd see today. Exactly. Hard to believe it's over 100 years old. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very cool. So after you've you know, been taking all of this stuff and making sure that it's well preserved, what do you do with it? Yeah, we um, rehouse it in archival safe um, housing and then we add it into the uh, archive room. Great. So is that where we're going next? Yeah, we'll show you. Awesome. So this is, has to be a lot that you take from here into this big archive. How do you organize it and manage all of this material? Um, we organize by collection, so our collections are divided up by company. Okay. So like Standard Oil of California, uh -huh. which is Chevron, um, Texaco, Caltex, and then some of our legacy companies like Gulf, okay. um, Union see. Oil. Is that why you have all these different labels on all the boxes here? Exactly. You'll see on the, the aisles, they're divided by the company name there. Um, so all this center area contains our vertical files, so all of our paper documents. Okay. There's <laughs> definitely a lot of them. Yeah. We have over 5,000 uh, linear feet of oh documents in this room. Wow. And so. over 2 million I images. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's incredible. It's a, it's a big project organizing I can imagine. So do you have to digitize any of these files? You know, it's kind of funny to see all of these paper documents today yeah. when we're used to finding everything on a computer. I know. It's, it's hard to um, prioritize what we want to digitize and then having the time and manpower to do it. Sure, <laughs> sure, that makes sense. Um, but in the last two or three years, we've digitized around 600,000 pages of information. Wow, yeah. And That's we've OCR'd the material, so you can really find needles in a haystack yeah. if you needed it to. That's great, you can just pull up that history. But as Maura said, deciding what you want to digitize takes a lot of time mm -hmm. yeah. and analysis. But we generally target the items that we think are we're gonna extract the most value from, mm -hmm. information-wise, whether, whether that's visual or textual. Sure. Which is how a lot of uh, paper documents, textual documents, are in, uh, in these boxes here in collections. Great. Yeah. So with, you know, all of the things that you have in here, is there any item that's especially interesting or your favorite or something you want to share with us? Mine is what's been called in academic circles as the, as the time information transfer experience. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Better known as a time capsule. All right. <laughs> and here is the time capsule for Standard Oil Company of California or Chevron. Right here, this was the actual vessel. Wow. A copper box put into the wall of our new headquarters in San Francisco in 1922. And this is our president, our CEO at the time, Kenneth Kingsbury, holding this very box. 
and placing it in the cornerstone. That's incredible. So this picture is just on Bush Street, is that where it was? Right, in San on 225 Francisco? Bush Street, That's the new headquarters, amazing. and there's some photographs here on the table. Now this is the uh, series of images showing the extraction in the 1990s, and this is our president at the time, Ken Durer, standing beside, of course, in the photograph here, Kenneth Kingsbury, who put it <laughs> in, holding the time capsule itself. Wow. Once it was open, there were over 100 objects from 1922, and it's a wonderful snapshot of not only the company at the time, but the country and even the world, given there are artifacts, newspapers, photographs from around the world, and things like that. But by and large, it was uh, this time capsule was developed for the employees and for our employees in the future. Really? And one of the most wonderful aspects of the time capsule is this typed list of 16,000, all the employees at the time, right here. Oh my gosh, that's company every name? Quite every a job, name. right? The company yeah, took great up. pride in its employees, or the human element, as sure. they were described at the time. And of those 16,000 employees, 11,000 of them were actually stockholders. Wow. So they trusted, they believed in the company. Sure. That many of them were invested, in, especially during that time. Correct. Included along with that list are the policies of the company, including the sick and disability, the life insurance and the pension plans, um, uh, vacation, things like that that showed how much we valued our own employees, that we wanted to take care sure. of them. And sure. that goes back prior to 1922 even. Really? Other th items you find in the time capsule, articles of incorporation, snapshot, a photo, like I said, a profile of all the integrated operations from drilling oil to transporting oil to selling the products. At the service stations, you'll find oil fields, service station images, tankers, ads, um, even publications from the day the wow. company put out. And those are in pristine shape, relatively nice shape. They're beautiful. Come out that long. Here's a wonderful stock certificate. And it's from Standard Oil Company of California, as you can see. And then on the other side, you actually have Rockefeller's signature. Oh yeah, there it is, right there. Right in there. <laughs> That's <laughs> incredible. Very popular piece. I can imagine. <laughs> there are a lot of large objects in the time capsule, but my favorite has to be this little coin. <laughs> and it was mixed in with other coins of the day, real wow. money. But this coin actually says Standard Oil Company of California, SOC, uh -huh. and the logo there. Sure. And on the other side, though, what does it say? It says, think safety. It's lucky. It's lucky. <laughs> and that harkens back to that, that still tradition, even by 1922, of health and safety in the company. Wow. And so yeah. every employee carried one of these coins around? Right. You were given this, just to remember, you could keep it in your pocket, you could set it as a paperweight on your desk, uh -huh. but it was a constant reminder to always be safe. And there you have the Chevron time capsule. That's incredible. Thanks, John, for showing us that. We also got in two other time capsules recently, too, really? which is really awesome. Um, it's nice to see that the company um, has always valued its people, employees, and um, safety. So it's not a new thing for us. Definitely yeah. not. Well, this has been such an interesting experience to see all this history in this one little box that came from our office yeah. in San Francisco. So thanks, Maura, for walking us through your archive process. We appreciate it. You're welcome. We'll see you soon. <laughs> see you. <laughs> So John, there's so much interesting history here and you know, we're lucky that employees we get to see this and our Facebook Live tour today, but does anyone else get to come and check out all the material that's in here? We do, we do have external uh, visitors come in. Most recently we had a troop of Girl Scouts. Really? I mean, yes, and um, they had a wonderful time looking at all the old Petroliana objects. We also uh, showed them some science, technology, engineering, and math heritage in okay. the company, where in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, we really were trying to educate and inspire um, young women and young boys um, about the industry mm -hmm. and get them energized. Maybe they'll want to join Chevron, become engineers or whatnot. That's incredible. So yes, we do open up our doors to the public by appointment. That's great. And awesome that everyone can share in this history and especially you know those young girls who might be interested in a you know stem job someday right so what is all of this that we have here this is just um, a, a diverse array of material that you'll find in the archive you can see photographs um, old product cans from the turn of the century uh, service station hats but we stopped <laughs> yeah. on one of um, the most uh, requested pieces of our history, and that is the service station history. And within that, the evolution of the Chevron logo. That's something I really want to talk to you more about. 
Well, we'll definitely get to that in a future episode, but I think unfortunately that's all the time we have today. So for those of you who joined us, if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section and we will try to get back to you. If not, we will be back for a future episode. So thank you for joining us.